Hello, everybody. Hey, this is going to be a lecture on um, torque and other rotational quantities. Uh, now, a lot of that we've already talked about. We're, we're going to elaborate on that. So what is uh, torque? We talked about this uh, last week a bit, and we know that torque is a, a twisting... It's a twisting force, right? Now, um, so we have some sort of um, force applied that causes something to turn or twist or rotate or move in an angle, okay? And we also, we also said that torque, which is going to have that Greek letter tau, is equal to uh, force times the perpendicular radius, force times the perpendicular radius. Well, what if it is not a perpendicular radius? What if the force and the radius are not at right angles to each other? Okay, then that is going to give us force times the radius times the sine of the angle, the sine of the angle between them. Okay, now we also uh, will remember that torque is also equal to I alpha. So there are a lot of analogies. You guys, there's a lot of analogies that go between uh, translation or translational or linear uh, relationships like the kinematic equations uh, and the rotational or angular. Now, one of those things is going to be I. Now, I is the rotational analogy to mass. And we talked about this last week, but I want, I just want to remind you that I is equal to the sum of the the sum of the MR squares, the sum of the MR squares. If we have discrete um, discrete things, then we can take its mass times the radius uh, squared and we will have um, the moment of inertia. So remember the moment of inertia. Inertia is uh, a property of matter who's who will have a resistance to its state of motion. Um, so that's just regular inertia measured by kilograms. A moment of inertia is the distribution, the distribution of mass about an uh, about a pivot point, which will um, resist a change in motion um, or rotational motions. Okay, so that's one way that we are going to calculate that. The other way is to calculate it um, by doing r squared. Dm, which we did last week, um, which was also the uh, question of the day for 927, at which point you're going to use this um, equation to calculate what the moment of inertia of a rod is rotating about one fourth, one fourth of the spot in between that. And uh, you guys can look up the examples um, to follow them either in the book or in, uh, from my lecture. Now there is one more. There's one more way to um, calculate the moment of inertia, which is called the parallel axis theorem. Okay. And if you know the moment of inertia of the center of mass, but it's not rotating about the center of the mass, it's some offset, then you are going to get um, your I is going to be whatever the I's center of mass is uh, times um, the offset, the mass times the offset squared. An example of that um, would be, you guys, if we had if we had a ring like so, now the mass is located at a constant radius, so that would just be uh, mR squared. But what if it was rotating? What if it was rotating at a point uh, tangential, right? Then, okay, if we have this, but now it is rotating at a point that is tangent, okay, we would take the uh, MR squared, okay? Uh, which would be um, the moment of inertia for the center of mass of a ring. Okay, and remember, we can look these. We can look up these um, formulas for various things on page 278 of your textbook, or just Google equations for moment of inertia, and you'll get a big long list. Okay, but now 
it's not going to give you one that rotates about like this, but um, we can add to this, which would be uh, m d squared, where this distance, which is the amount of offset, which would be the amount of offset, um, and that would give you this. Now, in this particular case, if that offset is just r, then you're going to have 2 m r squared, okay? But if we some, somehow had this offset so it was going at this distance, all right, then that would then that would be d. Okay, so this is called the parallel axis theorem. Uh, and a very handy a very handy thing to have. Uh, it would make some otherwise um, very tricky uh, calculus. Um, problem into something that is um, uh, is uh, much easier. Okay, so let's do a couple more examples here on uh, what torque is. Uh, so one question might be, um, is why are doorknobs put on the edge of the doors? Why is a doorknob put on the edge opposite opposite the hinges, opposite the hinges. And the answer is to increase leverage. Increasing leverage would be increasing your, um, your torque. Increasing leverage would increase your torque. And the easiest way to do that, the easiest way to do that is in to increase your radius, increase your radius. Um, and so that is why doorknobs are naturally kind of put on the outside. So when you uh, open this, Okay, let's say you're going to push on that, it's going to rotate, and that's a lot easier than uh, pushing somewhere close to the hinges. And if you've ever tried that, uh, it would be uh, rather difficult. I'm gonna draw kind of a, the end view. And so if we were to look at a top view of a door, let's just say that the hinge is on that side. And now if we apply a force here, and a radius there, okay? This right here is gonna give us the maximum, the maximum torque or the maximum leverage because we're putting all of our force as far away from the axis of rotation as we can, okay? So if we were to put twice the force, okay, twice the force at half the radius, twice the force at half the radius, that would give us that would give us the same amount. It would give us the same amount of torque. Now, what if what if we had two F right here, but we were not pushing perpendicularly? We were not pushing perpendicularly. We were pushing, let's say, at an angle of thirty degrees. Of thirty degrees. Now, if we look at our fr sine theta, fr sine theta, then that would give us, uh, and we're just going to use round numbers, we're going to have 2f, which would be our f times r times the sine of 30 degrees, which would be one half. And so by, if you push at an angle of 30 degrees, with twice the force, that's the same as the force pushing on the end perpendicularly because the sine of 30 degrees uh, is one half, okay? Now, just so we know here, if we are going to push, if we're going to have a force, let's say of 100, 100 times that force, but it's pushing directly, directly towards that, um, that hinge, there is going to be no torque at all because that angle is zero. And then we would say 100 times R times the sine of um, zero degrees, which would be zero, and therefore it all cancels out. And if you've ever tried to uh, move a door from the, uh, with a very low angle, you realize that it is a very low um, amount of torque. Okay, you guys, um, one other way, you guys, one other tricky thing, and if you think about um, some tools, tools are naturally, Tools are naturally uh, going to give you a um, certain amount of torque, okay? So this is an open-end box end, okay? And um, if we were to be applying 
if we were to be applying um, a force this way, okay, if we were to move it halfway, okay, that would be less torque or less um, leverage. So as we move farther away from the point at which is rotating, um, that would give us uh, that would give us um, uh, more leverage or more torque. Um, now, um, there is actually a way, okay, is you can end up hooking on two uh, wrenches together. So if you were trying to, for example, increase your leverage and you had another open end box end, you can put it on here and then you are increasing that lever arm, which is that radius, uh, and you could increase uh, increase that um, on that leverage. Okay, now you guys, what about units? What about units? Okay, so the units of torque is going to be, our force unit is a Newton and our radius Newton is a meter and sine has no units. So the unit for a torque is gonna to be Newton meters or meter Newtons, doesn't matter, okay? But what about work? Okay, uh, the units for work as we know are joules, but remember that's force times distance. Force times distance times the cosine of the angle. Well, now we're gonna have force, which would be Newtons, Distance would be meters, cosine, no units. So um, the units for torque are a Newton meter and the units for work are a Newton meter, but they are not the same. They are not the same. Um, a Newton meter, notice, is going to be having a sign there. So that's going to be perpendicular and cosine means they're going in the same direction. So that is a... Um, that is something that is um, looks contradictory, but one is moving uh, with a sine angle, and the other one is a cosine angle. So one uh, trick, sort of trick question that you will often see uh, in physics, you might even see it with me, is if this object right here is rotating in a horizontal plane, in a horizontal plane at a constant speed, there's going to be tension. There's going to be a force of tension that's going to be here. So how much work, how much work is being done? And the answer is zero, because if we look here, if it's rotating this way, we're going to certainly have a force, okay? But the displacement at any one instant is going to be tangential and therefore have a right angle to the radius uh, and therefore... Um, we would do no work because the cosine of 90 uh, is zero. Okay. So again, the units look the same, but they are not, they are not the same. Okay. Um, so what I would like uh, to do now is to um, go to do a, a problem. Now, this problem that I'm about to do, okay, uh, is essentially a combination. It's going to be a combination of example uh, 10, 8 first, and then with the same diagram, we're going to do example 10, 11. All right, so you're going to hear some examples uh, from, you're going to hear some explanations from me. When you read in the book, um, when you read in the book, um, you're going to see the same thing, but it might not quite have the same explanation, which is why I'm doing it for you. Um, the question of the day uh, for uh, 428 is going to have some similarities to the example that I'm about to go over. Okay, so I'm going to erase this. And what we're going to have here is we are going to take a, uh, a meter stick or a half a meter stick or whatever it might be. Uh, let's say a rod here, and we're going to just drop it. Okay, and when we drop it, okay, it is going to have an initial velocity of zero, okay? But as soon as we let go of it, it is going to accelerate. It's gonna accelerate downward. So the first, so the first uh, answer that I want is what is the initial angular acceleration? And then we're going to take a point. We're gonna take a point on the end, right? And it's gonna be rotating this way. 
what is that tangential acceleration? What is that tangential acceleration at a point at the end? And then um, we want to know what is the final angular velocity once it reaches once it reaches 90 degrees, once it goes from here down to here, what is its final angular velocity? And its initial angular velocity is going to be zero. And we're going to look for the final tangential velocity of this point at the end. Okay. So we have our diagram here, but we are now going to, we are now going to talk about, um, conservation con no sorry we're going to talk about that torque being f r sine theta and that is going to equal that is going to equal to i alpha so if a equals b and b equals c then they're all equal to each other right so we can actually get rid of this now what is causing what is causing um, the force. Okay. Now I think most of you would say if I let go of the end, then gravity is going to pull it down, which is certainly true. So this force right here is going to be MG, but where you guys, where is gravity pulling? Okay. Well, gravity is obviously pulling at all of these places, right? But we can think of all of the mass being located at the center of mass. Okay. So as this thing, as this thing will rotate downward, we can think of all of the force being right there in the middle. Now I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a little thought experiment, a little thought experiment. If I threw this, if I threw this, um, stick half a meter stick through the air and it was rotating, right? If we were to just concentrate on the center of mass, which is in the middle, okay, even though all this stuff would be rotating about, if we paid attention to the center part, it would follow a parabolic curve, ignoring air resistance, okay? And if we looked at a point, let's say at the end, it would have this weird vibrational, it would have this weird sort of curve that would be going sort of up and down while it moved from left to right. So. We can think of all of that mass as being located at the center and therefore our radius here would be at half of an L. Okay. So it'd be L over two. Now, um, this is going to start out where if we think about the force, the force is MG, but the radius um, being L over two, that's at 90 degrees. That's at 90 degrees. Okay. So now we're going to take the sine of 90. Okay. Now, technically it's going to be the sine of pi over two. Okay. But regardless, the sine of pi over two, which is going to be one. Okay. So this is part of our torque. Okay. That's the torque that's causing it to move. Now torque is also equal to uh, I alpha, I alpha. So what is, you guys, what is the moment of inertia? What is the moment of inertia of a rod rotating about its end? Okay. So we could go back and talk about the integral of R squared dm. But what we're going to do is we're going to look on page 278 of your textbook or any such chart that gives you the formulas for moments of inertia. And we're going to see that that is going to equal to one third um, m uh, ML squared, one third, uh, ML squared. Now in the question of the day, the question of the day for, uh, 428, it is not rotating about the end. Okay. And you're going to end up using the moment of inertia of a point one quarter of the way, which is the question of the day for, um, for, um, 27. Uh, and that answer, I believe, is uh, 7 28 uh, ml squared. Uh, so that's what you're going to use for your I. Now, the other thing we have here is we are going to have, uh, we're going to have alpha there. Now, this was the first thing we were looking for. So now we can divide by one third ml squared. And 
we can now cancel some things out. We've got mass that's going to cancel out. We're going to have this L cancel out with that L. This one, this three is going to go to the top. This two is going to go to the bottom. So our alpha here is going to be three halves G over L. Okay, three halves G over L. That is equal to our um, initial our initial angular uh, velocity. Okay, so let's put that up there. We're going to have 3g over 2l. 3g over 2l. You guys, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look just at our units here. We know that uh, g would be meters per second squared, and a uh, length would be measured in meters. And so um, those meters would cancel out and we would get uh, one over second squared. Okay, now a reminder that our units should be radians per second squared. And remember that radians have no units. Radians have no units. Uh, just remember what the definition of pi is, which is what we use to measure angles um, in a circle using radians. And that is the circumference to the diameter. And if we were to measure circumference in standard units, it would be meters. If we were to measure diameter in standard units, it would be meters. Those would cancel out. So there are no units. It is a unit, unitless ratio, okay? Which is why radians is a better way to measure angles, um, which all math teachers will tell you that it's better but we are not used to that, so we change everything into degrees, uh, 45, 30, 90, all that, because that's more familiar to us. Okay, so um, now what we're going to do is we want to calculate. We want to calculate what is the tangential acceleration, the tangential acceleration at the end there. And I want to remind you that we measure things like position and velocity and acceleration, okay? Uh, and from a linear point of view, we might more accurately call that translational, okay? The variable that we typically use is going to be x, but it could be y, etc. okay? And we, for angular, um, that would be uh, theta. We do the same thing for um, velocity, it would be V. For angular, it would be omega. Uh, for acceleration, it would be A for the linear, and it would be alpha for the um, angular. Now, the reason I'm putting this up here is because how would we equate, how would we equate our linear with our translational and the answer is if we multiply by r, okay? So linear distance would be equal to r theta, r omega, r alpha for um, those respective things. So now we're gonna use this relationship here um, to say that alpha times r would be equal to our tangential acceleration. So we know our alpha would be three halves g over L, and now we're gonna multiply it by R, which would give us our tangential acceleration. Um, but we want, you guys, we want to calculate what that tangential acceleration of a point is on the end, and that radius would be L. Okay, so we're gonna substitute this R for L, okay? And now we can see that it cancels out. So our tangential acceleration of a point there is three halves g, three halves g, which is really interesting because how can we, how can we get an acceleration if we just drop something like this tennis ball, what's its acceleration gonna be? And the answer is 9.8, right? Just the acceleration due to gravity. Now all of a sudden we take a stick here and we drop it from one end, the acceleration at the end here is going to accelerate 
at three halves or almost 15 meters per second squared. And again, it's sort of complicated because we have this rotational, this rotational sense. All right, so now we can plug in our tangential acceleration answer up here, which is going to be three halves g, three halves uh, g, um, which is interesting. It doesn't matter, you guys, it doesn't matter uh, what the length of the rod is, okay? The point at the end here, again, no friction in the pivot. The acceleration is going to be 14.7 meters per second squared or one and a half times 9.8. Now, at various points along the line, right, if we took a point here two thirds of the way, all right, then that would change our calculation and our tangential acceleration would not be three halves. So it was only the fact that it was on the end, only the fact that it was on the end. Okay, so um, I am going to um, stop this and give you um, uh, a new clean slate here and we'll talk about it in a second. All right, so our next question now is when it swings from here down to here, what would be the final angular velocity once it reaches down here uh, after moving 90 degrees? Uh, and what would be the velocity of this point on the end when it reaches the bottom there? So the way we're going to calculate that is we're going to use the conservation of mechanical energy. So conservation of mechanical energy. The potential and kinetic energy in the beginning is going to equal to the potential and kinetic energy final. OK, uh, and we know, OK, um, that our in this case, our gravitational, our gravitational potential energy, OK, is going to be MGH, right? So MGH initial, our kinetic energy is one half MV squared initial, except remember our this is not moving translationally, it is rotating. So we want our rotational kinetic energy. And if you remember that the angular equivalent, the angular analogy to mass is the moment of inertia, okay? And the angular um, velocity, okay, to the linear velocity is going to be omega squared initial. So we're going to have this MGH final plus one half I omega final squared. So this right there would be the conservation of angular momentum. Now, the question might be, the next question is like, where do we make, where do we make H equals zero? Okay. Now, if I were to take this pen and I were to drop it, where would we make H equal to zero? And the answer logically would be where my hand is, but it doesn't have to be, right? It could be down here. So if I drop it here, R zero could still be at this point. R, R zero could be at the top, right? And as we drop it, okay, then it's really, what is more important is the change, is the change in kinetic energy, or in this case, potential energy. So let's just take a look at this up here, just to illustrate this. If we were to move the U's and the K's around, we would have U initial minus U final, and that would equal to K final minus K initial. Now, remember that when we talk about change, we want final minus initial. So this would be the change in kinetic energy, but this we would have to apply a negative to switch these, which would be negative change in potential energy is equal to positive change in kinetic energy, um, which um, if you think about a pendulum, think about a pendulum going back and forth up here where it would momentarily stop, that would be its highest point, have its maximum gravitational potential energy but it's um, kinetic energy, it's kinetic energy would be zero because that's the point where we're to stop. And as it moves down, as it moves down, the velocity is gonna increase while the potential gravitational energy 
would go down. So they're moving opposite. So this relationship kind of shows us that opposite nature of that. Um, and, but now we're gonna go back to here. And if we had an initial velocity, okay, we're gonna say that our initial velocity uh, is zero, okay? We can get rid of this part right here. But again, back to where do we put h equals zero? So I'm going to say h is equal to zero, kind of at this halfway point, okay? And at this halfway point, that means the distance from here to here is going to be L over 2. So h final is going to be L over 2 here at the top. And as it swings down, it's going to go down to zero. Again, it has to do with the center of mass being representative of all of the mass, all of the mass. And so if that's the case, then um, our final height would be zero. And now we can say mg, okay? So our initial height is L over two, and this is gonna equal to one half. What is the moment of inertia of a rod rotating about its end? Again, page 278, we've already used this which is going to be one third ML squared. And now we want omega final squared. And now we can see um, that we can divide some things out here. So we've got a mass on both sides, so that'll cancel out. We've got a half on both sides. We've got an L and an L squared, so this will cancel out with that. And so if we want our omega final, that's gonna be the square root, okay? And we're going to have, uh, the three goes up here, that's gonna be three over L is going to be uh, equal to our final angular uh, velocity, the square root of three G L. Now, if we want our V final, okay, tangential, all we have to do is multiply by R, okay? Um, and um, that would give us our final angular, sorry, our uh, final tangential velocity once we reach at that point. Now, what is our R? Well, our R, I'm asking you for a point on the end. So this R becomes L. And this L on the outside of the radical is like saying L squared when it's underneath the radical. And now this L will cancel out with that. So now our final tangential velocity is going to equal to the square root of 3GL. Okay. Now, in the question of the day on uh, 328, um, I give you I give you this sort of thing, except now I'm applying a force. I'm applying a force, um, and it's going to cause something to spin. But we're going to do it in a horizontal plane, um, and therefore you are going to um, just have um, uh, not this mgh. You're just going to have a force times a distance. Okay, sorry about that interruption. So now we have all of our answers. So we have um, our angular, final angular velocity is the square root of 3GL, uh, and our final tangential acceleration is the square root of 3GL. So uh, one question might be, how long does that take? How long does it take to swing down? And it could be very easy to say, the omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha t, right? So we know that this is zero. We know that our final alpha would be the square root of 3g um, over L. And we know that our alpha would be equal to uh, 3g over 2L, okay? 3g over 2l, and we could divide that and we could get time, but that would not be correct. That would not be correct.
okay? And it's a lot more complicated than it might seem. Now, remember that this equation and the other equations are predicated on the fact that we have a constant, that we have a constant acceleration. And if we think about this for a moment, we do not have a constant acceleration, okay? That angular acceleration, that angular acceleration is based on torque, which would be, um, the torque would be equal to mgl over two sine theta. And um, as soon as this starts to drop, that angle is gonna change and therefore it's, it's no longer constant. So when we get actually down to the bottom, there would be no uh, torque at all. Okay, so the answer to this question is going to be a calculus one and one that I have not figured out yet. So I am um, working on that. So at any rate, all right, we will see you next time.